Welcome to ECTV. We are El Camino students bringing local news to the public. Today we will be focusing on Siana Kalia, a local El Camino high school student. El Camino is an independent study high school dedicated to student-driven education on the Ventura College campus. Now we will be joining Samaya, who is in the studio with Siana. Today I'm here with the intelligent Siana Kalia. We will be discussing how El Camino High School creates effective students. Now Siana, tell me, how long have you been a student at El Camino High School? I started El Camino when I was in ninth grade, so this is my third year. Nice. So what has your experience been like? I feel that I've had a very positive experience at El Camino. El Camino offers a lot of unique opportunities to students and I've done my best to take advantage of those opportunities. And if you were to rate El Camino 1 through 10, what would you rate it? I would definitely give El Camino a 10. Can you please elaborate? Well, like I said, El Camino offers students so many opportunities ranging from a personalized learning experience to lots of individual attention to Ventura College classes and so much more. In your opinion, what makes an effective student? I think an effective student needs to have good skills of organization and also needs to be willing to take on new challenges, to try new things, to go outside their comfort zone and should not be afraid of hard work and should be ready and willing to take on, uh, to take advantage of opportunities available to them. And do you feel you've done that the past three years? I've certainly done my best too. <laughs> okay. And how has the El Camino teaching method been effective to you? I very much like El Camino's teaching method. Mm -hmm. uh, at El Camino, students get a lot of individual attention and I feel that I can always get help when I need it. Okay. And what's the teaching structure like? Well, at El Camino, every student has a mentor teacher with whom they do most of their classes. And I think most students usually go in probably twice a week or something like that. I actually go in every day of the week because I like to go in to get help and to do my work. That's very nice. So what do you do on each day you go in? Well, on Mondays I go in to take my history tests. And after that, I spend most of the day doing math homework. And I do math homework on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays as well. And on Friday, I come to leadership class. And then I have English class and Geo Challenge as well. OK, so there are a number of clubs at El Camino. There are a number of clubs at El Camino. Okay. I'm involved in Geo Challenge, Knowledge Bowl, Math Club, and also Leadership. And do you feel that social environment has been effective to you, has been helpful? I really do. In my ninth grade year, I kind of had trouble transitioning into El Camino, and I had some difficulty making friends, but I realized that that lack of socialization was a bit of a problem for me, so I made an effort to improve that. I joined leadership and other clubs, and in being a part of that, I've, I've really benefited from those clubs. Do you feel there are any disadvantages at El Camino? Well, like I said, when I was in ninth grade, I had trouble making friends, and that can be a problem for students who don't really seek out a social environment, mm -hmm. like I did. Um, however, by being aware of opportunities on campus, students can avoid problems like that. Okay. And you're taking Ventura College classes, right? Yes, I am. Has that been beneficial to you? That has been extremely beneficial to me. I feel that my Ventura College classes have really prepared me for a college environment, which I will experience after high school. Okay. And what classes are you taking? I am currently taking Calculus II. Okay. And do you enjoy that? I enjoy that immensely. It is a very fun class. So when you're not at El Camino and VC taking college classes, what do you do in your free time? Well, for the last nine years, I've been taking lessons in figure skating, and I do that in my free time. Fun. That sounds fun. And what advice would you give to a freshman starting at El Camino? To a freshman starting at El Camino, I would say be aware of the opportunities that are available on campus and know how you can take advantage of them, know how you can become involved on campus, how to meet other people. And if you're struggling, absolutely talk to your teacher because they're there to help you. And also it's important to stay organized, especially in an independent study environment and to take responsibility for your own learning. Okay, and what are your plans after you graduate high school? After I graduate high school, I plan to attend a four-year university to study biology. Why biology? Well, I find biology very interesting because, well, for one thing, I love science. <laughs> and also, uh, when I took my biology course in ninth grade, I was truly fascinated by the study of genes and cells and biochemistry and related topics. 
Well, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Siana, for your time and allowing us to get a glimpse into the environment at El Camino High School. What an intelligent young lady. Now let's switch gears from an El Camino student to an El Camino instructor. Grace will be discussing a new system of history education with El Camino instructor Marsh Peters. Hello and welcome to our segment about the history discussion trials involving El Camino's high school testing curriculum. I'm Grace Johnson Glick here with Mrs. Peters of El Camino High School. Mrs. Peters is leading the program which is directed towards students looking to discuss, elaborate, and analyze American history chapters instead of taking the usual tests. Thank you for being here today. This is what fun is. <laughs> all right. My first question is, how long have you been a teacher at El Camino? 18 years. All right. Uh, and in all that time, like, when did you start to realize that a change needed to be made to the way you were teaching history? Well, part of this is the Common Core standards that are coming down from the their national standards. Before we had state standards, now we have national standards called the Common Core. And for those of us who have always taught creatively, they're not going to be that much different than what we've always done. It's teaching kids to give evidence. It's teaching kids to think insightfully. It's... Um, yeah. Could you explain the change that was made just so briefly? You're using more original documents, more exploration, yeah. more helping kids discover history rather than just memorizing dates and facts. Um, you're getting them to really understand what happened yeah. during the historical events and see the background to it to analyze the events. Okay, and who was involved in this decision to make a change like this? Well, ultimately it's a national decision, and then um, you know, at a, at a district, school district level, you know, we're all headed towards doing the Common Core yeah. better, and then at the site level, um, I, was, I was chosen to be on a small team to work on particularly the U.S. history standards, and um, how can we make U.S. history more exciting, more engaging for the kids, and how to make them better historians, able to think critically about historical events. Yeah. Could you describe the current process that you're using right now? Okay, so instead of um, a textbook, that we're, we're giving kids actual documents from the time. For instance, um, the last discussion we had was about the New Deal. Yeah. Um, and so Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, briefly, it was to use government money, put people back to work, they would build dams, national parks, roads, different things like that. With that money, then they would have money to spend and boost the economy and yeah. get us out of the depression. Um, and so most people think favorably about FDR and, and the New Deal. And yeah. um, so what I did was um, went to a place that had gathered the historical documents together from that time. And um, there were songs, there was actual fireside speech that Roosevelt gave, there was yeah. actual legislation, there were, you know, actual historical documents about the things that went on, the lunch programs, the dams, or whatever. And I gave the kids the, the actual documents and I assigned them into groups. This side has to argue that the, that the New Deal was really successful and the other side argued yeah. not successful at all. So it's like a debate. Kind right. Of. They have to be able to defend their position. And I thought, oh, how is this going to work? Because this side that has to defend the, the New Deal didn't work at all, how will they do that? So, like, how do you grade that if it's that kind of difficult to... Because, well, you can, you can first, you've told the kids to prepare come knowing about the New yeah. Deal. So, they, so it's how well they prepared how well they participate in a discussion. And participate doesn't always mean just talking, because yeah. we don't want them dominating the discussion. But how, mu how much are they engaged and not looking at their Quality cell Quality over quantity. Yeah. And how much are they involved in helping their group and looking at the documents and pointing things out. And then there's also a writing product that comes at the end that says, this is, this is the consensus our group came to. Yeah. Do you think students are more invested in this kind of way? Ab absolutely. Like I mean, I plan for them to stay an hour, and most of the time they have <laughs> stayed for two hours. Now I know yeah. in a traditional setting they can't do that, but these kids were passionate about their side, and they came out understanding um, the New Deal. They came out understanding freedom of speech during World War I when we had the Sedition Acts. They came, you know, they, they say, gosh, I understand World War I so much better just from studying this one part of it. Yeah. And it I feel like it adds a little bit more because they get different perspectives. Do you think that's true? Like right. It adds a new element to it instead of just having to memorize why something right. happened. And the kids that feel adamant, no, FDR, <laughs> he was the best, could do no wrong, 
and the kids who say, no, he was a total failure, both come to see the other person's point of view. And all the kids left thinking, no, the New Deal wasn't as amazing as I thought that it was. I can see that it's not just a black or white issue. It didn't provide um, relief for everybody. It was a racist program in some ways, yeah. for instance. Yeah. Um, so they, they got to see for themselves and come to their own conclusions about what it was, not just being told that, yeah. that it was great. So I think you made it pretty clear. What do you value, though, like between the two tests versus discussion? Well, I'm always interested in kids being excited about history, yeah. and, and I think I'm, I'm wanting to make them lifelong learners to love learning yeah. and love history and want to know how the world came to be the way that it is. So anything that we can get kids more excited about history and more engaged, yeah. obviously I'm going to like that better than reading a, test ta reading a text, take a test. Do you think we retain more, though, like through discussion, like Absolutely. you can remember yeah. more? Don't you? Well, yeah, you know me. I can. <laughs> it's. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Threw Sorry, you, off. you threw me off. Um, can any other classes? Do you think like we can change the way we teach any other class like this to add more discussion to it? Well, I I don't know. I I'm always striving striving to be more creative in the way that yeah. I teach. You know, I I especially feel this way in math. That um, yeah. you know, you would never have a, a grown person say, "I'm terrible at reading," but most adults would say, "Oh, I'm so terrible at math." And yeah. and you know, I think math can be exciting and fun, and you can get kids to say, "Gosh, I, you know, I feel successful at it, and I feel like I solved that that puzzle, and I'm I'm being given tools, and um, you can make them." You know, if, if, it's, if it's taught in a more creative way, you can get kids more excited about all different subjects. Yeah. All right. Uh, my final question is, do you think this is going to be what you end up doing for this kind of class? Like, do you think is, this is your final strategy or just no. the first step? No. I think teaching is continually changing. Kids are ch continually changing. Technology is continually changing. And if you want to be cutting edge, if you want to be relevant, yeah. you know, then you've got to be ready to change. And you know, I personally embrace change, yeah. and I very does. And um, I just think we have to try and do what makes kids learn the best that they can, yeah. and to be the the most successful for their future. Well, Mrs. Peters, thank you very much for being here today to delve into such an interesting new occurrence at El Camino. I believe that these history discussions are truly revolutionary and will bring new meaning to our education and testing curriculums. If you have any questions about future discussions, please visit the El Camino campus. On a more ghoulish note, we are joined by local historian and ghost hunter Richard Sennett. Kiana, take it away. Looking more towards the spooky side of life, or lack thereof, I have here with me Ventura's very own ghost hunting extraordinaire, Richard Sennett. We will be getting a glimpse into his life and experiences of hunting ghosts and exploring the paranormal. Hello, Mr. Sennett. Nice to be here. All right, so let's start off this interview with how did you get interested in ghost hunting? That's, that's fairly unusual, so it's very interesting if to I, hear about that. If you could have said that I would get involved in this stuff years ago, I would have laughed at you because I didn't believe in ghosts. Mm -hmm. But then I saw one, yeah. and it changed my whole fabric, mm -hmm. my whole point of view. I was doing archaeology one night back in 1979, mm -hmm. and I went into the courtyard of the old mission about 1230 mm -hmm. and saw a monk, which didn't scare me because monks lived there. I thought, oh, yeah. a brother is up. So I went to talk to him. He disappeared. That's cool. He vanished in front of my eyes. And I was sitting there with my mouth open. What happened? And then it dawned on me that this was a ghost. Mm -hmm. The next morning, I talked to the monks who lived there, and they said that a ghost figure had been seen by them. And that's what started me out. People ask, when did I become a ghost hunter? About 30 seconds after I, I heard about this. And from that day on, in the summer of 1978, I have been hunting ghosts. And I've been teaching classes on it, writing books. I've gone all over the Western United States. A lot of my work was done in Hollywood, where I have a lot of family connections down there. And I've um, had a great time. I've met some wonderful people. And yes, since that time, I have even seen a few ghosts. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, like mind-blowing, really. 
Um, so how old were you when you first had this ghostly experience? About 24. 20. But prior to that, I, I ghosts are just for the funny papers or mm -hmm. comic book stuff, you know, Casper. Um, my mother was very psychic, but I, uh, my mother, she's nuts, you know. <laughs> you don't give much credibility to your parents. Mm -hmm. But then, once I've had these things happen, I start to realize she was a lot more correct mm -hmm. than I gave her credit for when I was growing up. Alrighty then. Um, so, how long did you say you've been hunting ghosts? You said it was about 35 years now. And back in 2006, I was actually given an award for being one of the top 10 ghost hunters in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, how in the world did I get this high honor? What if I, I'm just a Ventura. I found out how I got it. I outlived everybody. <laughs> All the other great ghost hunter pioneers are dead, but I'm still out doing it. See, that brings up the question of, are they dead because of the ghost hunting? Or did they just happen to die just from natural causes? Natural causes, I wouldn't get involved in it. And I will say, I would much rather have a ghost in my house than a burglar <laughs> any day of the week. I have more to fear from the living than the dead. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Um, so tell me, what was your craziest experience when it came to, like when you were hunting a ghost once? Well, the craziest took place at a mansion up in Ojai. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's beautiful, huge, gigantic place. And a lady got the option to buy it, to open it up as a home for disturbed uh, teenagers, you know, drug rehab. Mm -hmm. Then she started to hear ghosts in it, chanting sounds, drums, like Native American spirits. Mm -hmm. She asked me to investigate. We went up there toured the whole place with psychics I had with me, mm -hmm. and then we saw a ghost. And nine of us all saw the figure of this woman appear in a hallway. She was walking away from us, and then she stopped and turned around and looked at us. And this is the only time this ever happened to me. All the ghosts I've seen look very solid. Mm -hmm. She slowly became transparent and just faded away. As soon as she was gone, I ran down that hallway, and I was looking for mirrors, projectors, something, nothing. Just like making sure it was this real. is not fake. Oh and and nine of us saw it. And the first thing I had to do is separate and draw pictures of what they had seen. Mm -hmm. And of the nine people, seven were identical, which is a pretty high standard. I did more research and found out the man who built it had a poor relationship with his wife who was abused and she had a bedroom at the end of that hallway. So maybe she was fleeing from her husband and uh, mistook us for him mm -hmm. and looked back over her shoulder. But it was one of the best sightings because I had the most people with me to confirm that it wasn't me being crazy, yeah. but something really was there. Mm -hmm. And was this your favorite experience that you've ever had while ghost hunting or? Oh, it was on the Queen Mary. Ooh. We uh, did a seance. My wife is a gifted medium. Mm -hmm. And so we did the seance. This, this is a broad daylight, you know, we're holding hands and all. All kinds of weird stuff happened. And I've been to dozens of seances. Mm -hmm. Most of the time they're pretty <laughs> blase. Yeah. This wasn't. One of the people, a total skeptic, he lifted up off of his chair by about 18 inches, is floating around. And he's a skeptic. He says, does this happen all the time? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> we had all these weird things happen. But the thing that, that made it most correct mm -hmm. was my wife started to speak Italian. And let me guess, she doesn't know Italian. She doesn't know Italian, French, uh, Spanish. She, she knows how to speak Russian and Swedish, but not any <laughs> romance language. Yeah. Anyway, it, it came to a broken down English word announced it had been a World War II Ital Italian pilot mm -hmm. who uh, died on the Queen Mary. Mm -hmm. And he gave all this data, like, and we were tape recording it. Yeah. Squadron number, his airplane, his commanding officer, the mission he was on when he was shot down, all of this detail. Goodness. And I tried to research it and I couldn't get anywhere. So I gave it to an English reporter who went to Great Britain to the Imperial War Museum. Mm -hmm. Everything she said was correct. 
and he even went to Naples, to where the guy's family <laughs> lived, and found his family. And this was big news in Italy, mm. <laughs> but it didn't help us out, of course, except for uh, it gave us some notoriety. But the fact that so much of what came out was confirmed by research, mm. that is the best experience we've had. That's so amazing. And please tell me, you guys did get translated what she was, what your wife was saying in Italian, right? Well, no, it, it started in Italian, oh. and then it degenerated into kind of pidgin Italian, half English, half Ita oh. Italian, which, which I could understand. Mm -hmm. um, he was also an awful fascist. Oh he really God. thought Mussolini was great, his cat's pajamas, you know. Mussolini is always right. Oh and uh, he hated English people, didn't like Americans much either. But uh, see, people don't change when they die. Mm. They still have the same uh, prejudices of dis and hates as they had in life. Mm. If anything, like they, if anything after that, there just wouldn't there wouldn't be any possibility of them changing, right? Yeah, you yeah. hope. My goodness. But and this was the best one we had because we had the most data that was confirmed. Yeah. So that's amazing. Um, so. What advice might you have for anyone out there that is new to ghost hunting, that wants to get, get into it and start exploring the paranormal? Well, first, it is the fastest growing hobby in America. Lots of people are doing it. First, read all the books. Don't just watch the TV shows, because <laughs> real ghost hunting is not like the TV shows. It's mm -hmm. like, well, it's like police work. Real police work does not look like the stuff on television. Mm -hmm. it, first, you don't catch the bad guy in an hour. It doesn't happen that way. <laughs> and same with ghost hunting. Many times you have to stake out a place for weeks, not just one night. Yeah. And so first, take, keep records yeah. on everything you do. You have to be very uh, anal in that regard. You have to write everything down. Second, be open-minded. Mm -hmm. Don't accept one theory over another. Ghosts are all spirits of the dead. They might be, might not be. Could be anything. Just go where the data takes you. And be very careful that you don't trespass or vandalize or break anything. Mm -hmm. This happens too often. A lot of young people go to a haunted site. They yell and scream, ghosts appear, and they don't appear. Yeah. And so they start smashing things. Oh, I'll knock over this tombstone if you don't appear. <laughs> don't do that. Don't vandalize. Also, I say never go any place unless you're invited. Don't trespass. Uh, that's, I know that, that closes down a lot of good places, but it's better to be legitimate than not. So those are just a few tips, but there's a lot of good books out there on ghost hunting that you can get. Stuff I didn't have when I started out. I have to find out, find it all out the hard way. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Senate, for spending your valuable and spooky time with us today. If you at home got, have any questions, Richard Senate, the renowned ghost hunter, is available through his Facebook page titled Richard Senate Ghost Hunter. That was, it was great talking to you, and I hope you have a lovely day. Okay, I will. Awesome. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching. Okay.